But I do want to read a story from the book of Ruth. For those of you who may not be familiar, uh, the book of Ruth, and uh, it's the first chapter, 22 verses. You can read the other chapters for yourself. We'll touch on them, but uh, here's the story we read in the book of Ruth. Long ago, when the judges ruled Israel, there was a shortage of food in the land. So a man named Elimelech left the town of Bethlehem in Judah to live in the country of Moab with his wife and his two sons. His wife was named Naomi, and his two sons were named Malon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites. That's why I didn't put it up there. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. When they came to Moab, they settled there. Then Naomi's husband, Elimelech, died. And she was left with her two sons. These two sons married women from Moab. One was named Orpah, the other was named Ruth. Naomi and her sons lived in Moab about 10 years when Malon and Kilion also died. So Naomi was left alone without her husband and her two sons. While Naomi was in Moab, she heard that the Lord had come to his people and had given them food again. So she and her daughters-in-law got ready to leave Moab and return home. Naomi and her daughters-in-law left the place where they had lived and started back to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back home, each of you, to your own mother's house. May the Lord be as kind to you as you have been to me and my sons who are now dead. May the Lord give you another happy home and a new husband. When Naomi kissed the women goodbye, they began to cry out loud. They said to her, No, we want to go with you to your people. But Naomi said, My daughters, return to your own homes. Why do you want to go with me? I cannot give birth to more sons to give you new husbands. Go back, my daughters, to your own homes. I am too old to have another husband. Even if I had myself, even if I told myself I still have hope and had another husband tonight, and even if I had two more sons, should you wait until they're grown into men? Should you live for so many years without husbands? Don't do that, my daughters. My life is much too sad for you to share because the Lord has been against me. The women cried together out loud again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, Naomi, saying goodbye, but Ruth held on to her tightly. Naomi said to Ruth, look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her own people and to their gods. Go back with her. But Ruth said, don't beg me to leave you or to stop following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you live, I will live. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. And where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. I ask the Lord to punish me terribly if I do not keep this promise. Not even death will separate us. When Naomi saw that Ruth had had firmly made up her mind to go with her, she stopped arguing with her. So Naomi and Ruth went on until they came to the town of Bethlehem. When they entered Bethlehem, all the people became very excited. The women of the town said, is this really Naomi? Naomi answered the people, don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very sad. When I left, I had all I wanted, but now the Lord has brought me home with nothing. Why should you call me Naomi when the Lord has spoken against me and the Almighty has given me so much trouble? So Naomi and her daughter-in-law Ruth the Moabite returned from Moab and arrived at Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. Now for those who may not be familiar with the story, uh, Ruth was not an Israeli. She was a Moabite. Uh, another people. She was a descendant of Lot. You may remember Lot who parked his tent, who built his home outside of Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, the the nephew of Abraham. Well, she's a descendant from that line. She's not from Israel, but she did marry a a Jewish man. Well, after the death of her husband, she stays with her mother-in-law, Naomi, and they decide they're going to go back to Judah. Where, while she's there, because of the kindness she demonstrates and the hard work she demonstrates, she actually catches the eye of a wealthy man named Boaz who takes her as his wife, and Ruth actually becomes one of the five women that are listed in the genealogy that leads to Jesus Christ. So she had a pretty impactful, uh, or a pretty impactful life, uh, especially down the road, but even then, but there's a reason for that. We see Ruth, but we also see in contrast Naomi. Uh, Naomi was her mother-in-law, but Naomi had left the land of Israel. She had left Bethlehem. The word Bethlehem means house of bread. She and her husband, because they fell on some difficult times, times of testing, they decide they're going to leave Israel for Moab, but in doing so, they know they are leaving the land of God's provision. They are leaving the land that God had called them to, and she's basically placing herself outside of God's care. And yet what's interesting is that Naomi complains that God is somehow against her. 
She says in verse 13, she says to her daughters-in-law, should you live for so many years without husbands? Don't do that, my daughters. My life is much too sad for you to share. Why? Because the Lord has been against me. That's essentially her attitude. The Lord has been against me. Now, Naomi's attitude, her response, I find is quite typical to people who know that they are not where they should be in God. And yet when life goes sideways, they still blame God. Do you hear me this morning? Maybe you've been in that situation yourself. You know you've made some decisions you shouldn't make. You may even know that you, that you intentionally violated what you know God has spoken to your heart, and then things begin to unravel, and what do we do? We tend to complain, or we tend to blame God for what is going on in our life. In fact, she uses the name Almighty twice to underscore the idea that God must be against you. And again, it's a very common response for human beings when we find ourselves in a place of struggle or challenge or pain or hurt or confusion, whatever it may be. We have a mindset that, well, if God really cared, if God really loved me, it wouldn't go this way or he would change things because after all, if God is God, then he's sovereign, he can do what he wants, and he's not doing anything, so this must be what he wants to happen to me. Well, what's interesting is the name Naomi actually means pleasant or happy. That's what her name means. But when she's away from Israel those 10 years, she comes back, her life is so dramatically changed, her friends are excited to see her. They say, could this be Naomi after all these years? She says, yes, it's me, but don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara. And she says, why? Because the Almighty has made my life very sad. And the name Mara means sad or bitter. Do you know people like that? Have you been your way that way yourself? I don't mean to, be, uh, to lack compassion when I say this, but I don't know how many Christians I've run into over the years, even within my own family, who make their own decision when push comes to shove, they essentially do what it is they want to do, and then when things don't work out the way they want, for some reason, they kind of drift away from the Lord, and then you talk to them later on and say, how's it going? Or, hey, you coming back to church? No, I'm not going to church. They're just full of a bunch of hypocrites. Right? It's always somebody else's fault. It's always the church's fault, somebody's fault. It's never their own fault. They never acknowledge, hey, I messed up. Hey, God is good, but I made some decisions I shouldn't have made, whatever, right? If a person acknowledges that, they usually make their way back to the Lord. But oftentimes when a person has decided, I want to do what I want to do, well, the way that I kind of placate myself is I begin to look at others and I say, well, they're really the problem or they're, reason, they're really the reason why. Now, two things kind of stand out to me in Naomi's response to her situation. The first is that we have no indication from Scripture that the decision that she and her husband made was actually by direction of the Lord. What we see, it seems to be, is just their own decision. Things happened to them, circumstances kind of pressed in, and they felt the logical thing to do was to leave that land and to go somewhere else. And so because they make the decision, to the, the, the events that follow, which was the death of her husband and eventually the death of her sons, they weren't God's fault. What they were were the natural result of exposing oneself to things outside of the boundaries of God's care. What God has established and said, this is my provision. This is what I have for you. This is where I want you to abide, to walk with me. But for whatever reason, we make our own choice to go in a different direction. Jesus said it this way in John 15. He said, remain in me, and I will remain in you. But get this, for a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine. You see, whenever we choose to go our own way, it's not God punishing us, it is us severing ourselves from the vine. Now, we may still resemble a branch. We may still even have a little bit of buds on our branch. We may have some grapes that are there, whatever it may be, that kind of still has the symbolism of, of, uh, of you know, being Christians, being God's people. But over time, what happens? We begin to dry up because we're cut off from the life flow. It's not God punishing me. I have made the choice for that flow to stop, for that provision to stop, for that presence to stop, that direction. And oftentimes we just go from one bad decision to the next. Well, another thing I see in Naomi's response is that her opinion of God is really not based so much on faith. It's not based so much on walking with God. It's based more on what I would call a religious superstition. Because even when She's parting ways with her daughters-in-law. What does she say? She says, go back to your people and go back to your God. 
I don't want to read into it, but it's almost like to her, one God's and another God, they're kind of all the same. It's just more of a toss-up, you know? It's just kind of a whatever you believe, you believe, and hopefully I believe the right thing, and, you know, hopefully I'm living the right way, and hopefully things will work out for me. After all, if, if God is the true God, and I'm supposed to be his daughter, his son, well, you know, hopefully he'll make everything work out okay. But there's no relationship there. There's no history. There's no, we don't have any example of really of faith, of walking in obedience to what the Lord has made clear is his way, and seeing the fruit of that. Because we're still attached. So, again, we see that contrast. The Bible says to us in James chapter 1, Let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God. In other words, God's doing this to me. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he tempts no one himself with evil. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desires. In other words, you could, another word you could use is that each one is drawn away when they give in to their own desires. You see, Naomi and her husband, it seems, they were enticed and lured away by wanting to do what it is they felt was the most logical thing to do. Have you ever made decisions like that? Have you ever felt in your heart the Lord saying, hey, talk to me about this? Or you may even feel in your, in, your, in your mind, in your spirit, that the Lord is actually speaking something to you. Hey, don't do this, or, or wait for a while. Don't make this decision yet. Don't make that purchase yet. Whatever it may be, right? But instead, we just do what it is we feel like doing, or what seems logical at the moment, what I want to do at the moment. Even if it means stepping outside of what God has said to me or God has chosen for me. And what we see in Naomi's life is that because of her decisions, the result is actually much, a much greater loss than she would have suffered if she had stayed in Bethlehem, where there was some dryness, there was some, some shortages there, but we see while she's away that God actually restores things in the homeland. But what she experiences in Moab, it so gutted her life, so gutted whatever faith that she had, that she actually changed into a different person. Rather than being happy and pleasant, she's turned into this sad, bitter woman. Do you know people like that? You know, maybe they had a certain disposition. They might even have had a walk with God that you admired as a Christian person, but they've just allowed circumstance. They've allowed, you know, making their own decision. They've allowed to, themselves to interpret things the wrong way, and they just become sad. They become bitter. In Exodus chapter 15, there's an interesting event uh, involving the people of Israel as they're traveling across the Sinai wilderness after they crossed the Red Sea. And here's what we read in Exodus 15. Moses led Israel from the Red Sea, and they went into the desert of Shur. For three days they traveled in the desert without finding water. Now imagine this. We're just reading the story. But you're talking three days in the desert with nothing to drink. I'm sure whatever they brought with them from uh, Egypt is long gone. So when they came to Marah, they could not drink its water because it was bitter. So imagine, you're traveling through the wilderness, you see this body of water, oh, thank you, God, you get there and you can't drink it. It's bitter, it's acidic. That is why it's called Mara. So the people grumbled against Moses, saying, what are we to drink? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. He threw it into the water, and the water became fit to drink. It became fresh or sweet. There the Lord issued a ruling and instruction for them, and he put them to the test. He said, here's your options. He said, if you will listen carefully to the Lord your God and do what is right. So listen and then do what is right in his eyes. If you pay attention to his commands and keep all his decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians. Why? For I am the Lord who heals you. Then they came to Elam, where there were 12 springs and 70 palm trees, and they camped there near the water. I am the Lord who heals you. Now, what's really fascinating about this verse, at least in my understanding, is the Lord speaks this promise to his people at a time when nobody was physically sick. There was no sickness in the camp. So why is he saying, I am the Lord that heals you? The issue is they're out of water. They're thirsty. They're dried up. There's nothing to drink. We're thirsty, and the Lord says, if you'll do what I'm telling you to do, you'll discover, I am the Lord who heals you. And I believe the reason for that is because the Lord was addressing something that needed to be healed at the level of their heart. And what needed to be healed was their attitude. What needed to be healed was the way they were responding all the time to any kind of challenge. You see, they were doing what a lot of people do. They were doing what sometimes even some of us do, and that is in a season or a situation where it feels like you're drying out What do we do if we're not careful? We grumble, 
and we complain. And you see, our grumbling and complaining is a revelation to us of a sickness of our heart. And what that sickness of our heart does is two things. Number one, it causes us always to respond negatively to every challenge. When something comes our way, we murmur. Don't you love that word, murmur? I mean, it even sounds bad. We murmur, we grumble, we complain, right? It's the first thing we do. And in doing that, what, do we, what happens? We have no open door for divine option. It's just negativity. And usually it's something like, pointing the finger to why did God allow? Why is this happening, Lord? Why would you do this to me? It's the first words that come out of our mouth if our hearts are dry, if they're not where they should be. In fact, sometimes the Lord will allow the challenges to press in against us to show us what's really going on at the level of the heart. So the first thing we tend to do is we respond negatively to the test, and the second thing is we lash out at people rather than calling out to the Lord. I said in the first service, I want to give you a little, little uh, uh, advice here. If your spouse is cantankerous, right? If they're just kind of lashing out of you, if they're in a bad mood, right? They're just kind of taking it out on you. I want to encourage you, look them in the eyes and lovingly say, go talk to Jesus. <laughs> right? And then come back and talk to me. Because that's all it is. You can't change that attitude. All that's going to happen is you're going to lock horns, you're going to get in a fight. In fact, I encourage you, if you both know the Lord, take a breath and say, let's get in our, our own space and talk to Jesus by ourselves. Let's allow the Lord to deal with our heart. So when we come together, we speak hope, we speak love, we speak faith, we speak options. We're not just dealing with this in the flesh. The Bible says Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. Other translation says it was a log or a tree. Moses throws that in the water, and we know from the story the water becomes fresh, and they can all drink. Now, if you know your Bible, then you know that that piece of wood really is representative of the work of Jesus Christ through his cross. At the cross of Jesus Christ, there was never in human history a person who was treated more unjustly. There was never a person who was treated more unfairly. There was never a more innocent person, a more undeserving person of that cruelty. Never in human history. And yet what we see in Jesus in the cross is that what does he do? He comes to his father and he says, Father, on three occasions, if it's possible, Father, let this pass from me. But then he submits to his father and he says, Father, but I know what you're going to work out on the other end of this. So, Father, not my will. I don't want to just clutch onto my life. I don't want to be spared of this and miss the recovery that is going to take place on the other end of the cross. So, Father, I submit myself to you. I'm going to walk through this cross. Why? Because I know you're with me. I know that none of this would be happening without your purpose, without your design. In fact, you know the story. Pontius Pilate says to Jesus at one point, don't you realize I have the power to give you life or take your life and Jesus says you have no power over me other than what's been given to you from above. Jesus knew that and he held on to that cross. He, he, he clung to that cross. In fact, if you ever saw the, the passion of the Christ, I'm not saying this is the way it was, that it happened, but one of the things that impacted me and what, what, what the people marveled at who was looking at it, you may remember the scene, the cross is on the ground. Jesus is here being beaten. They're getting the cross ready and Jesus actually crawls onto the cross. That wouldn't surprise me if that's the way it happened. Because Jesus says, this is why I've come. I have come through my cross to bring full recovery. Everything that was lost through sin, everything lost through rebellion, even my enemies who in their own ignorance don't understand what they're doing, I've come to recover them and to bring them back to the Father. That is the cross. And the Lord wants you me to understand that no matter what I am going through, no matter what is coming to me, if I will come to the cross, there is grace there for me. There is strength there for me. There is a person who's walked before me more than anything I I've ever gone through. And he says, I've gone through it. I've cut the path. Here's the way to go. Don't make your own decision. Don't jump to your own conclusions. Don't go in your own direction. Listen, here's where we're going. You follow me, and I'll lead you through to the other end. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare before me in the presence of my enemies a table. And Lord, I feast in your presence. I feast on you. You are my sustaining grace. And whatever it is, it has come my way, Lord. 
Jesus can make the bitter things in life fresh again, but it requires something of us. It requires something of us that we see in Ruth, whose name means a friend. I really believe that Ruth is an example to all of us of what's required if we really want to recover in our lives what's been lost. Any area of our life where we know the enemy is at work, any area of our life where we know because of unbelief or just the hardship of the things that come our way, even times when we're blindsided, how in the world did this happen? We still have a decision to make. Am I going to just jump into it and try to rectify things or lash out at things at people? Or am I going to come to the Lord and say, okay, Lord, I don't understand what's going on. But I know you do, as we sang in that first song. And so, Lord, I'm going to cling to you. I'm going to come to you. I'm going to wait on you to see what it is that you have for me. And the one characteristic we see in Ruth that I really believe we need to see more and more increasingly in our own lives is one simple word, and that word is tenacity. Tenacity. God is looking for tenacious people who will follow him. You look at Ruth. She was absolutely unwavering in her commitment to her mother-in-law. She couldn't shake her, couldn't get rid of her. No, I am staying with you. Your God's going to be my God. Your people are my people. I'm staying with you. I want to go live in the land of bread. That's where I'm going. And she was also untiring as she worked in the field, as you read in chapter 2. And her drive and her determination were rewarded by marriage to this wealthy relative of Naomi named Boaz. She became his wife, and she became the great-grandmother of King David. And she was in the line in the genealogy of Jesus himself. You see, Ruth was not Jewish. She was a Moabite. And to me what that says is she's an example to us of how the promises of God are not inherited. They are grabbed hold of. There's a difference. You see, friends, we live in a day today where you almost feel like in our generation, well, I should just receive everything God has for me by osmosis. You know, I'm around Christian things. I talk Christian. I don't do most of the things that Christians aren't supposed to. Whatever. You know, I come to church and I enjoy the presence of the Lord, but it's like, Lord, but why is my life changing? I mean, I come to church and I feel better, and we should all feel better. It should be refreshing. It should be encouraging. Nothing wrong with that. But friends, that's not how you live your life with Jesus 24-7. There's got to be a tenacity in your heart. There's got to be a fundamental decision where I make up my mind that whatever God has made provision for me, I'm grabbing that. Whatever God's promise is for my family, for my finances, for my workplace, for any situation that comes against me, what does God say? What does God have for me? What would he have me actually take hold of? That's why Paul says we need to keep working to complete our salvation. He's not saying to get more and more saved. He's saying the effects, the power of your salvation grows more and more, becomes more and more complete. That's called maturity. That's called sanctification. We start at salvation, our sins are taken care of, we have a clean slate, and now we stand before God and he says, I've got all these provisions for you. And part of maturity is learning how to walk day by day, season by season, each provision. And as I grow, then the Lord says, okay, now you're ready to begin to understand this concept and grow in that. See, that's why the Lord doesn't lead us in formulas. That's why Christian formulas and cliches don't work. You can't just read books. You can't just listen to someone you enjoy preaching and maybe quote them or say, well, you know, well, well, that person is sick. Well, they told me that I have to say that I'm not sick. And if I say that I'm not sick long enough, then I'll be okay. No, if you're sick, you're sick. But you see, we have a God who can heal. That's the difference. I don't have to deny the sickness. I don't have to deny anything that's coming against me. I don't have to worry about saying words because all of a sudden I leave some, I mean, I mean, curses are real. Don't get me wrong. That, that can happen. But, you know, we can get so caught up in just the formulas. But real faith comes through testing. Real faith comes through situation after situation over the years where when push comes to shove, I say, Lord, yes, this is how I feel. This is what is coming against me. I'm going to be honest with you. I don't have to play games, Lord. In fact, I might as well not because you already know my heart. You know what I need before I even ask. So I thank you that you take all that mass away. I can just be real. I can just be me. But in the midst of it all, I say, but God, but God. I have a resource. I have a relationship. Jesus Christ makes a difference in my life. But with all that he's done for me and makes provision for and how willing he is to lead me, it still comes down to my fundamental choice. Will I grab hold of him? And will I grab hold of what he has made available to me? 
Ruth is a person who, because of her tenacity, experienced recovery at every level of her life. And the Lord has the same for you and me. Now, you remember the words of Naomi? She says, the Almighty has made my life very sad. Interesting, isn't it? Can you imagine saying that? Yeah, because we all do. Let's be real, right? If God really loved me. What do you mean if God really loved you? For God so loved the world that he gave his son. Yeah, but if God really loved me. Whatever form it takes on, we all verbalize that in different ways. But essentially, there are two views of God's sovereignty. One is that we believe God is sovereign, and therefore, whatever happens just happens. There's some faiths around the world that believe that, well, God is God, and so if it happens, well, it must be God's will. So that's one view of God's sovereignty. The other view, which I believe is biblical, is that although God is sovereign, that he can do what he wants to do, what he wants for us is to go after everything is provided for us. Everything is made available for us. He says, that's what I want you to do. That's my sovereignty. If you will believe me, if you will go after it, if you will contend for that, I am with you. You see, my friends, God is patient. He is so patient. He's our Heavenly Father. But we forget sometimes that God says, I love you. I'm your Father. I will always be here for you. But it's time to grow up. It's time to grow up. Come on, people. How long have you been around Christian things? How long have you been around me? Where are you in your maturity? Where are you in understanding what it really means to walk with me? He doesn't want us just to agree with him like Naomi, that he's almighty. He wants us to understand how that almightiness actually works in my life, what he offers me. You see, when Boaz noticed Ruth working in the fields in chapter 2. He didn't know who she was. He asked around and discovered that she was a relative of Naomi. But not only that, but she had also asked permission that she might glean in the field. And for those who aren't familiar with the custom, uh, the, the law of God had, had ordained that, or had commanded that when you're harvesting your fields, that you're to leave a little bit on the outside so that those who don't have anything can come and maybe just gather enough for a cake or a bread for their family for that day. And so that's what she was doing. She was going around just kind of picking up scraps, whatever she could. She was there all day long, all day long, just taking hold, taking hold. Every little scrap she would see, every kernel, she'd pick it up, pick it up, pick it up, doing that all day. Well, Boaz is so impressed by, his, by her work ethic that he tells the foreman, listen, as you're working on the other fields, just leave a little bit more grain for her, a little bit more stalks for her, some of the you know, larger pieces, so when she comes by, she can get that. And so she continues to work. All night she's working, gathering as much as she can. In fact, we read that she had, uh, when, the, when everyone else was gone, what does she do? She doesn't just go home with the, with the stalks. She goes to the threshing floor, beats all those stalks, and she actually ends up with 30 pounds of grain. Now that's a whole lot of stalks, a whole lot of beat, and a whole lot of work. If you can imagine a 30-pound bag of tiny, tiny little seeds of grain, that's the work she put into it. What was she doing? She recognized that there was stuff that was being left there for her. And she went after every little piece that she could find. She let nothing go to waste. She said, there's another piece. There's another piece. Oh, I know it's late. There's another. No, I'll just be a little while longer. There's another piece there. She wasn't going to miss a single thing that was left behind for her. Jesus said this. He said, the kingdom of heaven is continually being taken by storm. And those who are taken up by storm are seizing it as a precious gift. Let me ask you this morning, is Jesus precious to you? Is he really precious to you? Is your salvation precious to you? That is not just a ticket out of hell, but you realize you've not only been saved from judgment, you have been saved to a whole new life. You've been saved to a whole new level of understanding, of living, of fulfillment, of fruitfulness that you can never imagine. You have been saved unto something. Do you realize how precious that is? That's why when it comes to serving Jesus, I know one of the things he's speaking to me about, and maybe he's speaking the same thing to you, and I just thank the Lord for many ways that I do enjoy him, but I just find more and more the Lord is just speaking to my heart and saying, Paul, do you need that? I'm not even saying it's bad, but do you need that? Like, why are you looking for fulfillment in that? Why, why is that part of your schedule? Why does that take up some of your time? Here's something else you can do. 
right? And like one of the things I'll do, for example, when I go to, when I go to bed at night, I mean, you can click on YouTube or whatever social media you do. I just kind of make it a habit to turn on uh, just testimonies of miracles and ministry, just street ministry, guys hitting the streets. You know, why? Because um, it's the last thing I'm thinking about going to bed at night. It's one of the first things I'm thinking of when I get up in the morning. It's one of the things that's on my mind as I'm going through the day is, Jesus, what are you doing? Just a simple little thing, just a little tweak, right? But, but it, it reminds me of what the Lord has done for me. It reminds me of what real joy is. Real joy is not just getting through my day, getting through my week and a paycheck and buying a new toy or, or some new activity, some new you know, pleasure, going to the movie, whatever. I'm not saying those are bad things. But friends, you all know there is nothing like talking to somebody about Jesus. There is nothing like encountering somebody and knowing God is in this. I mean, there's a whole different level of fulfillment. There's a whole different level of, of what it really means to be a child of God. And, and it's just a, a, just a taste of, of one of the many, many wonderful things the Lord has made available to all of us. The Lord says, I want you to seize your faith as a precious prize. That word seize is interesting because it describes an action that has to be forced. And friends, there are some things that you have to force yourself to do because the situation demands it. You've got to make a decision. You see, God has made all his power available to you and me, but the choice is yours. The choice is mine. He can't make the decision for us. If you don't make up your mind to take what God has placed within your reach, what God has made possible to happen, then it's not gonna happen. And you know what? It's not God's fault. It's not his fault. He's placed it within my reach. You see, Naomi was a believer in God, but it was an empty belief that ended up blaming God for her life whenever things got difficult. Despite the fact that most times when things got difficult, it's because they were the result of her own decisions. Ruth, on the other hand, understood that God's sovereignty didn't work against her. It actually worked for her. And the opportunities they provided were within her reach. She could see them, they were within her reach, but she understood she still had to go after them. And she did. And that was the difference in her legacy and Naomi's legacy. And friends, it doesn't matter what area of life you apply it to. It can be your relationships, it can be your finances, it can be your ministry, it can be revival, whatever it may be, whenever you come to the starting place of something new that God has for you, it is always by seizing it. It is always by making up your mind that you are going after that, that you actually move into it, always. As I've said before, the things of God never just fall into our laps. Never just fall into our laps. I mean, there are things like a, a good heavenly father like we do for our children. There's basic provision the Lord has for us, but there are new things the Lord wants us to come into, and we've got to decide whether or not we're going to break into that, whether we're going to grab that, whether we're going to let go of some other things and go after this precious prize. But you see, Naomi allowed her circumstances to dry her out, and that's why she changed her name to Mara. But God said in Exodus 25, if you will listen carefully to the Lord your God, and if you'll do what is right in his eyes, then he says, I am the Lord who heals you. I am the Lord who will bring you into that wholeness. As the musicians come, I want to remind us this morning, friends, we all know what it is to hear God's voice. You don't need another sermon. You don't need another seminar. We all know what it is to sense the Lord is speaking something to us, that, that quiet voice that we just know is outside of ourselves. And the interesting thing when the Lord speaks to us Often he speaks to us just about those little things. But if you'll start paying attention to those little things, and if you'll come to the Lord, get away from the noise, and say, Lord, I just bow my heart for a moment, and I ask you to lead me. I want to go in your direction. I want to do what it is you want me to do. Rather than making decisions on your own, rather than going directions that will lead you away from him, if you will do that, if you'll take care of those little things and seek the Lord in your decisions, then you will begin to see on a regular basis the Lord recovering every area of your life. You see, there, there are just seasons where the Lord will draw your attention to something. It may be a situation in your family. It may be something to do with your children. The Lord says, okay, okay, now it's time to park here for a while. Now it's time to incorporate some fasting and prayer, whatever it may be. Now we're going to begin to deal with this area. You see, it's, the Lord's just not zigzagging us through life. He has He has strategy. He knows when I'm ready. He knows when, when you know, something needs to be given attention to. And if I'll just listen, rather than fall into the trap of just doing what seems right in my own eyes, or when the heat gets turned on, 
allow myself to believe the lie. Well, if God really cared, why don't we ever blame the devil? Why do we call it acts of God? <laughs> you know, Satan comes to lie, steal, kill, and destroy. I'd love to see a weatherman say there was an act of evil down off the Florida coast, an act of Satan, and homes were destroyed. But it's always God. Why? Because it's the powers of darkness that's the fallen flesh. Oh, God, if you really care, then this, 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 this. And God says, no, I really care. Here's the way to go. Listen to me. Do what I tell you to do. Walk with me, and I'll bring you into fruitfulness.